and welcome to our great discussion, a very interesting panel discussion on resilience in the Middle East. Uh, we have a great panel here. I hope you can hear me. Okay, so now you can hear me. And uh, we only have an hour. And I know you're all, uh, you're all very preoccupied with lots of Zoom and webinars and lots of topics and lots of interests. And indeed, since the corona, there's so many events that have really um, occurred from Belarus and Russia and Ukraine to the Middle East, to Yemen, to Saudi Arabia, to relations with Israel and other issues. Any case, um, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to waste any time. We have a super panel here. We have only one hour uh, very quickly in, in the order that they're going to speak. It's going to be Maha Yaha, I'm sure, I'm sure you all know, director of the Middle East Center in Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, number two will be my friend and colleague also, Paul Morelis, director of the Bar Bar Barcelona Center for International Affairs in Barcelona. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Maha, for joining us. And number three is going to be uh, Samai. It's always been a challenge doing these Turkish names, Oro Zurmez, as always a professor, Bill Kent University. And finally, and um, it's not because it's not a big issue, it's Mark Dawood, political, social, environmental activist, Beirut. And I put Mark at the end so that he can pick up on some of the points that are going to be raised. So um, since the issue is resilience, um, Maha, I have to really ask you um, as succinctly as possible, I mean, what is this resilience? Is the society resilient or is the leadership more resilient because they're not changing? Thank you, Judy, and th thank you for inviting me to be on this great panel. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, no, it's actually the leadership that's proven to be, I think, far more resilient um, than, I wouldn't say anyone thought, but anyone hoped for, at least in 2011, when the Arab Spring began, the Arab uprisings began. Um, what we're looking at today is a considerable uh, entrenchment and the return of authoritarian practices uh, with a bang. Um, a lot of these structural weaknesses that drove people to the street in 2011 are not only still there, i.e. things are look, for example, I take exa Egypt as an example, Look, things look very stable on the surface to some extent, but there are fundamental structural problems, simmering social grievances, and the buffers that were available to kind of mitigate these grievances have been considerably depleted. Above and beyond that, there is a systematic, uh, as the kind of macro, uh, economic picture is declining in a place like Egypt. There's a systematic attempt to undermine uh, all kinds of societal connections uh, between people. We saw this in the beginning in 2014, it began in 2014, and uh, when Sisi came to power uh, in a coup. <laughs> And um, it has continued in a very, very insidious manner. I'll just give a couple of examples where, for example, an NGO that was dealing with street children um, was the, the founders of these NGOs were taken into custody. So we're seeing the regime go after human rights activists, go after just about anybody or any, any kind of, seeming connections between different groups of societies, NGOs, networks, etc. And this is not unique to Egypt. We're seeing systematically similar retrenchments taking on different forms across the region. One place where I've become very allergic, I was <laughs> joking with you earlier, to the use of the word resilience in Le is Lebanon. People keep talking about the resilience of the Lebanese and the resilience of Lebanon. Uh, frankly, uh, what we've seen over the past year is that the political leadership has proved to be incredibly resilient. Uh, actually, in, a, in a, what they've shown themselves to be, and here we are one year later after a catastrophic economic meltdown, an even more catastrophic uh, 
explosion um, that was caused by the sheer criminal negligence of the political the politicians in power uh, and yet fast forward one year later nothing has happened uh, we don't know what happened to the port. There are thousands who've been injured. I mean, I, I'm not going to go through the figures, but the country is literally falling down the drain. Uh, it's not, I mean, I once said it's on a bullet train into the abyss. And yet very little is being done to try and stabilize. On the contrary, the no policy uh, making is actually a policy choice in and of itself in a context like this. Meanwhile, um, the you know the security services, as not as to the extent of Egypt, but like Egypt, are going now after uh, activists, and I'm sure Mark can speak more to this uh, later, uh, who are uh, anybody who's critical of the president, for example. Um, we're seeing similar things in other parts uh, of the region. Now, of course, all of this is happening. Just one last comment, and I'm done. Uh, all of this is happening in a in a post Pax Americana context, uh, uh, strategically, but also in the region, which is actually, I mean, this started with President Obama and has amplified with President Trump. But what that has meant basically is that countries in the region feel free to define and interfere in each other's business based on their own interests and when it suits them. So they can be with on with one side in one country and on the opposite side in another country. There's no issue there. And that has, I think, amplified the context, the conflicts in the region and undermined uh, some of the, quote, societal resilience that was very much part of uh, this region, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, the societal fabric, the people to people support, etc. I mean, in Lebanon, for example, people to people support has been very powerful and it's actually what's sustained people until now. But it's not enough. At the end yeah. of the day, this is not enough. Mm. So, um, and then you bring in come and I mean, I'm not, I won't go into the details of Turkey and Russia and Iran but and we'll that, do that kind later. of interference. Yeah. Maha, right Maha, um, um, thank you for this, and it's it's a very grim prospect because it shows that certain regimes actually are more resilient. But the the big issue is that with this kind of resilience, does it actually breed a, a kind of another uprising down the road? Frankly, with this pent up frustration and uh, the kind of um, lack of a, a political dialogue of any kind of communication, I. I I don't want to even think what's going to happen in Egypt in, in the coming uh, months or years, not to mention Lebanon. Paul, I want to move over to, to Barcelona. And Barcelona prided itself, uh, the Spaniards, on this big uh, Euro-Mediterranean dialogue and everything. And now resilience, which was the buzzword of NATO and the EU, I mean, frankly, it's lost all uh, kind of credibility. Could you jump in here? and uh, give us the, the European view of how they really see the resilience of how we've got the idea of resilience so wrong in, in this part of our, our neighborhood? Sorry, I was uh, muted. This, is, this happens in every Zoom uh, discussion that we have. So sorry, and thanks, Judy, for, for the question, for organizing this, and, and, and to you, Lisko, of course, for, for, the, for, for the research that we've been doing on this. I mean, I'll take it from the EU side, exactly, from the European side. And first, I mean, resilience has totally uh, permeated into the strategy of the European Union even of various member states speaking about resilience uh, and the general narrative that we have on how to do foreign policy today. Basically, we've come to the conclusion that foreign policy equals building resilience anywhere you act, right? And this is the, the, the mantra of, 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 of what we, when we're discussing these this sort of strategies. But first, I mean, we should ask ourselves, what is a strategy and what is a strategy for the European Union? And it's basically four things. I mean, to have a foreign policy strategy means that you have a good reading of the challenges uh, in the world that surround you. Second, that you have clear visions 
and principles on how you interact with this reality. So what is your own vision? Third, what are your interests when you have to defend your own position in this troubled world? And four, what instruments do you have to do so? And here, the problem with the European Union since 2016 until now with the global strategy, but even before that, is that somehow we have done a good uh, reading of the world. We have aligned our own reading of the world we live in with what we say about the world we live in, right? We've adapted to multipolarity, at least in, um, in, in words and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the contents of these strategies, of the distancing of the United States from Europe. And we have made our principles, our vision, also more according to this to this reality we've become more realistic less normative we've become um, more uh, like uh, seeing the world uh, not so much the way we would like it to be but rather uh, how it is and of course we've adapted to this more contested and untroubled world that we live in so on the one hand the problem is not so much on the reading that we do that we do of the world we live in the problem comes on the other two aspects of what a strategy is, the interests and the instruments. Because resilience is a very good vision and a very good response to this challenging, um, um, to this challenging world and this troubled world. But is it really the way we can best defend our interests? And is it really the way we can align our instruments to act in this world we live in? In other words, can we build more resilience today than being a force for good that the European has always been or has always claimed to be before? Are we more in a position to build resilience today than we were before in building a, a, a nice world as we claimed? And here I'm a bit more skeptical about this. And let me tell you why. Um, First of all, our interests diverge. I mean, we have to acknowledge that. On Libya, among member states, is a clear example of divergence of interest among EU member states. On the relations with external powers, our interests and our visions always also differ. differ. On Russia, on China, on the US, there are multiple visions within the European Union on how to uh, deal with these external powers. And our instruments are increasingly fragmented. So is, if I was saying uh, we are not uh, more capable to build resilience today than we were building a force for good yesterday is because our instruments are fragmented. So first of all, what, would, what we need to do, and I'll leave it here, is think strategically, but permanently. I mean, it's not that we can think about strategy every 13 years, as we did from the European security strategy to the EU global strategy. I mean, strategy needs to be fine-tuned and needs to go forward yeah. as, as, as we speak. And, and then I'll go to the, priori the next priorities later in the second round. Super. Paul, that was very interesting. <laughs> Europe is, is um, actually the corona, the pandemic has shown just how fragmented Europe is in terms of all sort of foreign policy issues. And we're even fragmented inside on, on, on how to deal with, with the pandemic. Um, which brings me to the Turkish angle, Sama, welcome, and it's great to have you with the Carnegie Europe Forum and the EU list go, where we go back now sometime since this uh, project started. I just wonder, um, from the Turkish angle, looking at the idea of resilience in the Middle East, um, I mean, is, is, uh, is what Maha talked about, touched upon, I mean, this Turkish leadership seems either extraordinarily resilient or using external factors to try to deflect away from the actual lack of resilience of what's plaking, taking place in Turkey in terms of the health, in terms of the crackdown on human rights and the, the prison system and so many issues. Um, how, how do you see this, this language of resilience? Is it, is it um, being exploited by Ankara or does it have any meaning whatsoever? 
Uh, Judy, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, when you invited me and, and when I saw the title of the panel, I thought uh, it's a great opportunity to bring together uh, the Turkish angle or however Turkey would be involved in the region, but also the ULISCO research on resilience, right? Uh, I mean, um, I'll probably resonate most of the points raised by Maha and Paul, and I'll try to bring in uh, a few questions that came to my mind. Now, let me start with two very brief points. One, um, as you will remember, as all of us are aware, in EU LISCO, we try to uh, define resilience as transformative and adaptive capacities of societies, right? So that's that's the part of the story that we have. And the components and sources, which we sort of try to identify together, are building trust in those societies, group-based trust, uh, building and contributing to legitimacy in those societies, and identifying adequate institutions that will be able to carry this forward, right? Uh, so on all those three accounts, um, when we think about the region, um, I remembered uh, Brodel's piece from a very long time ago, thinking about the history of the region, the Mediterranean, right, and trying to understand the shifts that have been taking place uh, in terms of the demography, in terms of climate, in terms of economic resources. And it seems all these are back uh, on our agenda uh, after hundreds of years and also decades. Now, the second point I'd like to raise is I revisited one of my articles and that just goes uh, back to Paul's points about strategies, visions, interests, and instruments. Um, I had written an article with a colleague in 2011 on Turkey's approach to the European neighborhood policy and the um, Union for the Mediterranean and how their interests might have converged, but their instruments and their reactions had differed. Uh, and the way I had identified at that time Turkey's position was because Turkey wanted to remain on a track of accession rather than be confined to a particular um, frame of uh, being a neighborhood country or being in the neighborhood. Now, um, then I asked myself three questions um, when um, this panel was put forward. One of them is, why is this region always characterized by conflict, war, dispute, um, disagreements, uh, etc.? cetera? Uh, and second, why is it so difficult to um, construct cooperation and coordination among the actors? Uh, some of the points that uh, both Paul and Maha has raised. Uh, and the third one is, why is it so difficult to, um, in fact, build societal resilience with the involvement of external actors? Now, it might be surprising, but I'll try to sort of uh, bring us a perspective that, that is more historically entrenched than we can focus on for just today. Um, everyone will probably remember, um, up until 2009, between 2000 and 2009, uh, Turkey had a foreign policy which seemed to be a continuation of um, peace at home, peace in the world doctrine of Ataturk, uh, which was zero problems with neighbors. That turned out to be a problematic doctrine in the end, but it, it, at the very beginning, the idea was to be involved with the region, to, to actually turn to the region, uh, to build, similar to what I had written in, the, in that article, what EU was trying to accomplish, stability, prosperity, security, and to be able to do that through cooperation negotiations. So it seemed that about a decade ago, that was the track that Turkey was on with respect to the relations with the region. And in fact, um, in 2009, Turkey had tried to sign um, you know, agreements of visa-free travel with Syria, etc. So what happened there is um, the two points that Turkey has been engaged with, which is the context-specific risks, you know, contributing through trade instruments to, to the prosperity in the, to, in the region, that did not work very well. And the second point very much resonates what uh, Paul had put down, which is the po policy divergence, particularly about not only interests, but preferences. The reordering of preferences on how to cooperate in the region for Turkey had been very different. Uh, and for the points on societal resilience, I'll come back in a moment because I think you're showing me the one minute uh, about the uh, faltering legitimacy and trust. Thank you, Judy. I think it's really interesting what you say, Samia, because I remember covering Turkey quite extensively and, and there was the, um, the, the no conflicts policy, uh, friends with all our neighbours uh, in 29, 2010, 2011, it's fallen apart. And also from from the EU Mediterranean dialogue, or oh, will this big um, optimistic euphoric thing? We can all have a free trade area, and it's fallen apart. It's um, it it just puts um, resilience into the dustbin. Um, so, which means that uh, Mark Dow has to pull all this together. Mark, um, have you been listening in in um, 
<laughs> with, with trepidation or, or do these views confirm your worst fears or do you have an optimistic note for us about resilience and welcome? Are you there? I think you have to uh, unmute yourself. Hello, Mark. Okay, it's, it's unmuted. Yeah, hi. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you for having me. Um, uh, I think I'm more on the positive note, and I, I think on, on the underlying uh, elements of the events, there's one major element that has been introduced, I think, to uh, societal resilience that has been mentioned, and that has been the constant eruption of mass movements and social movements that have uh, been capable of throughout the Middle East, starting in 2009 or 2005 in Lebanon or in Turkey, or uh, up to what happened in Lebanon here or in Iraq. Um, there is a, a new factor, uh, which is people can erupt into protest and create contentious political debates. And the European powers have to side uh, on how to deal with that new element and how to address it and who to discuss with. So I think that is a new element uh, far away from the centralized dictatorships or theocracies that used to uh, run the show uh, based on the elements or the decision of one single person. In addition, I think the flood of refugees into Europe from the Middle East has also strengthened the organic bonds between any contentious politics that runs in the Middle East and then is expressed in protest movements or is expressed around European cities. Plus, when we start seeing that many of those will become voting members, such as what Erdogan is doing with the Syrian refugees, nationalizing a few 10,000 or 100,000 plus, or the refugees of, with that status in Europe who eventually will opt to remain in Europe and become a voting bloc. So I think at some point in time, we're realizing that in the coming four to five years, those individuals will reflect the politics of the Middle East in European countries, thus mm. exerting more pressure either by their voting capabilities or by their tax dollar or their tax euros that they're paying. And in addition to that, European powers in assessing the stability of Middle Eastern regimes will always evaluate the mobilizations of the streets and the organizations that can change the dynamic or surprise through a mass movement or through a probable electoral win when those elections actually do happen in several uh, of the countries mentioned, whether in Sudan in the coming year or so, or in Algeria or in others. So not to go uh, further into the details, I would add only one more angle. And I think a lot of what I've been following up on the resilience of North African countries and Middle Eastern countries, especially with COVID and the decline of oil and gas and the decline of militant ideologies across, I think there is more and more momentum on discussing uh, uh, productive economies and uh, the North Africa and the Middle East uh, substituting, especially with American pressure, productive capacities from East Asia down to uh, the uh, North Africa or others through free economic zones, whether those are happening through Eastern Mediterranean gas uh, investments, development of relations, uh, free zones in Morocco, Airbus manufacturing parts of its planes in Morocco, we're starting to see a trend uh, of a migration of productive industries into countries which are closer to Europe and away from the, the, the battle between the giants, which is China and the US. So uh, I think that is it for uh, the first five minutes. I'm, I'm around to do a second round. Uh, Mark, that was really very interesting and uh, slightly optimistic. I, I, I wish uh, Europe was behind this because you know what our trade policies are like and it's what Paul touched on, you know, national interests and uh, pr protecting their economies, protecting their trade. And I was wondering, you know, will the pandemic, pandemic even make Europe, will, will drive Europe a little bit more towards protectionism 
just as a very small example, we see this extraordinary conflict inside the EU over having a trade agreement with Latin America. This has been going on for nearly 15 or 20 years. And it's just not going to materialize, although we know how helpful this would be. And when it comes to um, Tunisia, Algeria, North Africa, I mean, there's huge um, lobbies inside the EU that just, it's what Paul said, don't look at the longer um, perspective that actually trade does increase a kind of resilience. So we're back to we're back to this this issue, um, the societal resilience. I mean, if this if the society is a bit more resilient, aren't the regimes afraid of this, or are they willing to actually channel this resilience into something, into a kind of better kind of governance, or is this being naive on my part? Whoever would like to jump in. Can I can I say a couple of things, uh, Judy? Uh, just to build on what was already said, I think perhaps a different way of looking at societal resistance or uh, resistance resilience. <laughs> that was Sometimes. a poignant slip. <laughs> Coming from Lebanon, so <laughs> or actually from the region, I have to say it's the same thing across. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, it, it, one way of looking at this, honestly, is to, at least from the perspective of Europe, in the the um, what we're seeing today is is causing considerable turmoil in Europe's southern neighborhood. As I said, the kind of free for all foreign policy approach, the restoration of autocracies across the region, the uh, deliberate weakening of societal fabrics. Actually, in some cases like Syria, the evisceration of societal mm. fabric, the complete mm. uh, uh, herbicide, the, the total destruction of entire towns, major towns, and the wholesale uh, uh, eviction of millions of people. I mean, all of these are... Uh, events, if you like, or, or actions that are taking place that are weakening resilience yeah. in Europe's southern neighborhood. So if we really want to think about societal resilience in these regions, the question then goes back to Europe. What can Europe do mm -hmm. to build up societal re uh, resilience in these regions? Certainly uh, acquiescing to the demands of autocracy, autocratic leadership, siding with them, uh, supporting them in one way or the other is not the way to go. Mm -hmm. And I think we see this mo perhaps most clearly in Syria where Europe has managed to maintain a kind of a moral uh, upper, upper standard despite the rifts within Europe around this issue, do you normalize or not more normalize? And even though we're in a situation today where it looks like um, at least Bashar al-Assad is here for some time, not, and this is, I think, the myth, many people think that if Bashar al-Assad stays in Syria, that will stabilize Syria. Actually, to my mind, that means Syria will continue to be uh, an epicenter of instability in the region and therefore of lack of resilience. So I think the, the question to Europe today is systematically, what kind of foreign policy does it have? What kind of leverage does it have, whether it's trade or others, to try and um, support a broader regional settlement uh, on you know, whether it's Syria, whether Iran or whatever, uh, but one that actually lives up to the aspirations of its populations. People went down to the streets in the millions. Uh, and it wasn't just because they felt like taking a stroll in the park. They went down to the street because they were asking for fundamental rights. And these rights have still not uh, happened. I'll take one last example, uh, perhaps very much closer to Europe than even Egypt is Tunis. Uh, Tunis, there was a successful political transition, yet on the socioeconomic front, 
um, it's an incredible dire straits. The gap between the haves and have nots, between the regions, the, the coast and the hinterland, one can go on. And it's actually materializing now into greater political fragmentation on one side, uh, at least on the side of the, sec the more secular groups. But even on the amongst the, there's there's a, there's actually the rift in I, I mean the, uh, in identity politics is growing larger. So Tunis is systematically, even though ten years later it did manage to instill a political a peaceful political transition, it's actually more unstable in some ways than it was ten years ago. So where is it that Europe went wrong? in the, its policies towards uh, Tunis. And here I would say often the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. There wasn't a unified EU policy. Thank, thanks, multiple this is, policies. Um, this is an unbelievably long story about where did the EU get it wrong. One day we will sit here. I know, I know. Get it right. but I had to throw it in. No, no. Mark, Mark <laughs> if we want to, to talk about yeah. systematic policies, we need to start somewhere. It's true. I completely uh, agree with you. Thank and you, Mark, really for reminding Not about where it went wrong, but but perhaps more of where it can go right. Precisely. What would the, what yeah. would the making of yeah. a okay. successful EU policy that builds uh, resilience in mm -hmm. the southern neighborhood? What what should it look like? And I think perhaps that's where we can have more input. I, I completely agree on this. And Mark, you wanted to jump in and then Paul. Yes, I, I, yeah, I wanted to just de describe the scene as I, I probably am assessing it. Europe is squeezed in the middle between the larger powers such as China, US and Russia uh, with their aggressive stances in the Middle East and the local powers, which are Turkey, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, who are all trying to speak directly to the Americans or the Russians or others to get them involved heavily economically or to get them involved militarily. So there is a tight squeeze there in the middle. And I think the way out for Europe uh, in, in that sense would be to exercise massive soft power influence over the Middle East, especially with the uh, aspirational perspectives that a lot of the Middle Eastern populations have towards Europe in terms of improving their careers or languages or work or other. So I think on the economic, the cultural, uh, and even on media levels, the consumption of European generated perspectives on geopolitics, on economic issues, uh, the universities and others, as more uh, soft power engagement comes, instead of watching Turkish series all the time to the Arab populations that praise a certain value or a system, suddenly we can see a different European soft power perspective that can help. So uh, engaging with the media, helping culturally and economic opportunities will all play a, a very active role in increasing the influence of Europe to sustain and repel the rising powers which are locally present and the international powers that are forcefully trying to dominate. Thank you. Um, Mark, thank you for this. Um, we're getting into a big issue here over soft power and you know how effective the EU soft power has been and they pride itself on this is this is the the, the answer to all sorts of things. Paul, you wanted to jump in here. I, I'm I, I'm I think soft power could be reformed. Please, Paul. I don't want to um, take up your time. Please. Yeah, no. It's it's on the on the issue of societal res resilience that was raised by by Maha and also following on Mark. Now, um, listen. I mean, if we look at at the at the at the history of relations with the uh, with the European uh, southern neighbors, um, and we look at the Barcelona process, and we look at the European neighborhood policy both of these big frameworks of relations with the southern neighborhood had at its core also improving relations with societies and among societies in the region. So this is not something new that has come recently as a need for the European Union to uphold the development of, so of societies in the south uh, instead of regimes or instead of, 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 uh, uh, of the governments and, 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 the, and the forces there. So, so I mean, we have to be uh, 
to a knowledge where we come from to understand what's failing today. And today, if we look at it, and I've, I've also been studying this um, in the Balkans together with Paul Varghese, a researcher at CIDOP, and we're writing a paper for LISCO on this precisely, two things have happened. And I think this applies to the Balkans, but applies to the South as well. On the one hand, the reforms, internal reforms are lacking. I mean, and they, and, and if not worsened, in the, in, the, in the last few years in the Southern neighborhood. So the regimes are stronger. Uh, authoritarian regimes after the Arab Spring are stronger, are, are making a huge comeback. And second, the delivery capacity of the youth for fostering reforms has um, basically uh, not vanished totally, but been very absent and relating to the soft power that Mark, Mark was, uh, was uh, mentioning. So in a certain sense, after uh, the global strategy, after our resilience buzzword today, things are not so different than uh, after 1995 or after 2004. So the, the challenges remain the same. So basically what we should not do when we talk about uh, uh, societal resilience is to understand that it's basically a, a, a synonym of, of societal stability, right? Because resilience was meant to replace the approach to stability. So, so, so let's put things clearly. If resilience, the, the concept also only helps us to basically forget stability and talk about something else, then um, this is nice as, a, as, a, as an exercise, but it doesn't have any, any effect on the ground. And this creates the big problem of fatigue towards the European Union instruments and the European Union capacity to basically be a foreign policy actor precisely at a time when there are other foreign policy actors that have more leverage and more capacity to influence and less, string, less uh, strings attached than the EU has. Sami, you want to jump in? Absolutely, yes. And I'd like to pick up where Paul left from, uh, because we have been working also on a paper inspired by the EU LISCO research. And I'll bring in the concept of tipping points, right? Uh, because societal resilience is about being able to prevent risks or fend off risks that are going to bring about governance breakdown and violent conflict. And I'll give a solid example now that we're discussing the role of the EU and the role of, the, of Turkey vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a major uh, issue that had been taking place as a result of the several crises and cascading uh, risks, which Mark brought in, which is forced migration, right, uh, since mm, 2011. Exactly. And, uh, and forced migration um, in the framework that we have been studying constitutes uh, a major risk because it has, number one, a huge strain on public resources in all countries, which had been, uh, in fact, all the time uh, struggling with economic performance and resources. Second, it has also a challenge on the lack of uh, pluralistic and inclusive institutions because there are more numbers of foreigners and forcibly displaced who are coming in. Uh, and not only are they not migrating to these countries, but they're fleeing conflicts in the region and they're also bringing in their own poverty, their own um, ethnic and, and also religious and other um, tensions amongst them into these countries. And the host societies over time, especially in the Syrian crisis from 2011 onwards have, uh, be have become more hostile to receiving these individuals. And, and our comparative study of Jordan, Lebanon and Turkey has uh, suggested that up until 2018, these countries were trying to cope with uh, the crisis with the help of the European Union. You know, the resilience response plan, the 3RP is mostly about the European Union's donorship and, and it's also about its contributions. The facility for refugees in Turkey, the way it came about with the EU-Turkey statement is also about EU's external uh, efforts. But what it has done, to go back to Paul's point, is just contribute to moderate resilience, just to keep everything in a way that would not tip over to governance uh, um, and uh, breakdown and, and violent conflict. Please go ahead, Judy. I think you had a question. Judy, you're, I'm now you're on mute. I'm, I'm, now, uh, I'm now, can you hear me? Yes. No. Sorry. Um, it's really interesting what you say, Sammy, on all these issues, but I mean, it, the subset is the EU is throwing money at these issues rather than dealing with the structural element. Ma, you wanted to pop in here, virtually actually, jump in here. It's virtually jump in. Actually, that's exactly what I, I, I wanted to point out, is that what you're describing, Sanam, is humanitarian support for, you know, a refugee crisis, um, you know, to basically food, drink, water, etc. That 
stabilizes slightly, but it doesn't, I mean, I completely agree with what Paul is saying. We should not confuse, you know, this kind of support maintenance, I would call it just, you know, superficial, not superficial. I mean, it's, it's, it's significant, but it's maintenance rather than profound stabilization where you're addressing the core issues. If you really want to create societal resilience, both in Lebanon, but also for Syrian communities, then the approach has to be completely different. Uh, it's more about political uh, negotiations, about settlements, about what happens where and how. So I think I th we, we shouldn't confuse the two, to my mind. Um, the same goes for support to Lebanon. And I mean, a lot of what's coming, what's coming to Lebanon today from the EU and others is really not about, uh, it's about helping people in need, bottom line. Yes, this, you know, supports societal resilience in the very short term, but it's not going to prevent people leaving. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely not helping. Uh, it, it's not something that has a long lasting effect, let's yeah. put it this way. Mark, Mark, can I jump in here and ask you, because um, I haven't, um, it's great to have you on this panel because you're, you're sort of facts on the ground, everybody's facts on the ground in this panel here. But um, I, I think Paul raised, a, I've got two questions. One is, uh, I, I completely agree with Paul, and, and equating resilience with stability. And the commission, EU Commission did this big paper in 2011, 2012 um, about stability. And the values took a back burner. This was about stability. You can't have stability in the region. Uh, no, you can't have values and democracy in the region until you have stability. I'm slightly um, exaggerating the content of the, the paper, but it was a, it was a it was a mental shift that the the, the region has to become stable first b before we really push ahead with with all sorts of rights. But stability actually needs justice and the rule of law and a proper democratic infrastructure. My question to you is um, something very basic. If we go on about societal resili resilience, why didn't the rubbish get dealt with? Uh, my take on the first question, Syria was very stable from 1973 all the way to 2011. I didn't see how stability helped. So uh, Sudan was pretty much very stable as well. Uh, Libya was perfectly stable under Muammar Gaddafi. Even they did, did a deal on the Panama flight and everything else. I think the stability of dictatorships is just fake. It does not exist. It is just a temporary fix at the cost of a lot of human uh, suffering in those countries. That is just pushing the problem forward. It is not stabilization. Stabilization is allowing for forces within those societies to be active contributors to the debates and the discussions happening. And I think getting tired of the situation and what is happening and going back to that type of stability of allow Sisi to rule Egypt, it's too big for us to solve, then that is again dragging that problem for another explosion down the line. So I think there is no alternative to building local capabilities, which is res resilience. And if Europe does not have the stomach to engage militarily or forcefully, within uh, the Middle East, which obviously it doesn't, neither in Syria nor in other places, that gap is being filled by more ex ex uh, aggressive and expansive powers, such as uh, Russia or Turkey or Iran, or people who are, uh, or, sorry, countries such as China or the US, who are uh, not only using power, but they're using a lot of economic force and a, a lot of trading power, whether in China or in Saudi or in others, or even in, in Iran and getting those economic groups. So I think for Europe to have a more active role towards a sustainable, stability, stable situation later on, it has to find allies 
and it has to be a negotiator between the political forces within those states, whether it is the deep state such as in countries such as Egypt or others, and the societal forces that are, are obviously erupting and destabilizing those countries on a constant flow. And as I said before, even more riskier for Europe now is they've got a lot of that opposition, societal opposition, living in Europe, and they will be forcing and asking a lot of questions and making those topics a top priority in local European politics, whether it's refugees or their contribution to society or their political priorities when they start voting. Can I show out you are muted now? Judy, you're mm -hmm. muted. We're, we're coming, uh, sorry, um, I'm not used to Zoom, I'm only joking. Um, we're coming more and more around to this issue um, that uh, the, 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 the question I want to raise is the fact that the, the refugee issue, the instability issue, what Sisi is doing, uh, the problems of Tunisia, especially though the migration refugee, it should have made the Europeans much more uh, relevant and much more aware that they have to be much more intrusive in helping these societies make the transformation. And what I find very interesting about the EU approach, and, and Paul, tell me if this is wrong, that the idea of uh, the language of transformation is not in the vocabulary of the EU, unlike our Eastern neighbors. We, you, we see the Eastern neighborhood in a completely different uh, through a completely different lens than the southern one. The southern one is remote, it's chaotic, it's unstable, better to have these uh, regimes, so-called stability. But we, we don't use the language of any kind of transformation. And this, this bothers me a great deal because this is our neighbor. And I was wondering, um, is this a big weakness in, in the EU's worldview of the region? Thank you. Okay. There are, there are two things here. One, and the, and the very important one, is that the EU has become much more inner looking due to the, 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 the effects of recurring crises over the last decade, um, has become more inner looking uh, and more preoccupied with uh, dealing with itself and its disagreements, internal disagreements. And that has certainly not made EU foreign policy disappear, or foreign policy disappear, but indeed uh, place the emphasis on of discussions elsewhere than relations with the southern neighborhood or with whomever uh, at the global level. Right? I mean, this this is a reality, and 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 you take refugee crisis, you take the economic crisis, you take the Corona crisis, and you take Brexit, and you bring them all together, and then what this creates is this lack of attention to other serious issues, but also, and this relates to what Mark was saying, um, a much less ambitious uh, foreign policy and a much less um, normative foreign policy in the sense of saying, listen, you should, you should transform yourselves to become a bit more like Europeans. How can you tell an external power, an external actor, a, a foreign country that this region or that country should become more European if the European Union is in flames. It's very difficult. It's a very difficult message to convey, right? And this is very important uh, to, to take into account. The second issue that I think is quite important is uh, that we've tended to focus very much on, on unnecessary trade-offs, right? And, and values versus interests. And this relates to what you were saying before, Jedi. Um, values versus interests. I mean, there's no, no one with, with the other. I mean, the, the European Union will never be a value-free foreign, uh, foreign policy actor. No, it will always have values to run its foreign policy. Uh, and it should not understand that it only has values and it has no interests. No, I mean, they, they, go, they go hand in hand and the global strategy rightly points out that. Uh, the thing is, are we in, as Europeans in a position to change the internal politics of different places according to the values that we have, this is where our leverage has gone down very dramatically in the last few years. Does this mean that we should um, uh, not pursue these values when doing our foreign policy? No, that is a different question, right? So we should probably be able to combine both. Um, uh, Paul, I was, I, was, I was not saying the transformation of the societies based on 
our European model, but the transformation in terms of being much more inclusive. And we have a, we have a question here from the audience. In view of the EU-Turkey worsening relations, could EU use some of the Arab states' united front against Turkey to redefine EU policy towards this country? What would be the pros and cons of the approach, both in terms of the EU position in the region and in how it would affect Arab societies' democratization efforts? Ooh, ooh, we only have about three or four minutes left. <laughs> Senator, Senator, do you want to jump in here? Thank you. Well, I think, um, I mean, I, this question, but I wanted to pick up where Paul left off and, and about Maha's comment. And, and the question I think will, will have its own context uh, for two reasons. Number one, um, I would like to resonate what Paul just said. The literature already says the EU's um, external actor effectiveness relies on two particular uh, pillars. One is for that for it to be recognized as a legitimate actor that can be involved in matters, right? And the second one, it's bargaining power, meaning overall bargaining power. And this has been very much affected. And I'll reflect again on what I know best, you know, forced migration processes and EU's involvement by EU's very, to sort of um, use another example of Paul's inner looking strategy of the EU, that EU itself within itself, the member states reactions have diverged from each other immensely in 20. 15 and afterwards. Mm. So this disunity within itself has challenged majorly two particular components of being an actor whose legitimacy would be recognized and whose bargaining power would be sufficient for all countries to recognize. Number one issue is that reacting to the force of the displaced to be arriving at their shores really, um, you know, fiercely to the extent that um, to go back to Paul's point about values, right, to the extent that there was, uh, uh, in fact, recognition of violation of human rights in the pushbacks and, and all the troubles that were raised by border controls, its leverage has been challenged. Uh, and, and number one issue is, um, to go back to this technical assistance, at least in the case of Turkey, I completely agree with Maha on Jordan and Lebanon, and the Jordan and Lebanon compacts also went in a very different route. Uh, but in the case of Turkey, it has introduced to the context the concept of social cohesion, in a very different way, right? Because this is a country where temporary protection actually is being discussed. And it's a country where these individuals will never be recognized as refugees due to the reservation to the Geneva Convention. So I think in terms of if we were to talk about any normative change that could be introduced to this particular setting, it has tried to introduce that. Now, whether that has supported resil societal resilience is where I will stop. It's very difficult to, in fact, measure societal resilience. And I think that's where we all run into trouble. Uh, uh, so press on mute. Uh, you can hear me, yeah? Um, so uh, to wrap up, um, we're in a... <laughs> we're in a, not a particularly good situation because what we haven't, I mean, resilience is about um, a health structure. Resilience is about clean water. Resilience is about the environment. Resilience is about climate change. Resilience is about opportunities, education, demography, emigration, immigration, diasporas. These are huge issues that um, are barely get on the agenda, either in the region or indeed on the EU. And um, I will just leave this thought to to the five to the, to the to the four of you that maybe uh, next time we meet we have to really be much tougher when it comes to the whole definition of resilience, and much tougher when it comes to the uh, the issue of, of of the EU soft power, which means that you all have about uh, forty seconds to reply. Uh, Maha, you're first. Sorry, um, it, your voice broke, uh, Judy. I'm sorry, so I didn't catch the question. The question was, there, there's the other big issues of the climate change, of energy, of uh, corona, health structure. These are not on the agenda either of the EU towards the region or indeed among the, these regimes themselves. And yet it's building up for a, a serious explosion of some sort, a social one or a political one. Um, it's the region, to put it very bluntly, is, is a kind of, um, it's, it's, it's a powder keg. Yes, it's thank you. It's a powder keg and it's yes. there, the explosion has happened. Yes. It's happened yes. in multiple ways, in different ways, and it's taken different forms because at the end of the day, countries in the region also differ from each other. Yes. It's not a one size fits all and it's not the same thing everywhere. 
Mm-hmm. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, in, in approaching the region, there's been a privileging of the political and the humanitarian because that is what is forcing itself on the agenda. So a securitization of foreign policy yeah. and a focus on humanitarian support is is has become the, the, the policy agenda towards the region. It's no more about trade, nor climate change, nor, nor, nor. And I think we need to shift. We need to yeah. actually consider that stabilization in this region will not happen without due consideration to climate change, because climate change is directly related to society. Etc. I'll, I'll stop here just to give. No, it's very important, questions. Mark. Mark, you, you would. I mean, this is something we didn't deal with the whole the whole climate change issue. But I mean, this yes, is um, this must surely yes, be I on the agenda. Agree. Yeah, but yes, um, for sure. And the dynamics are are already being felt. The increasing wildfires in Lebanon, uh, the displacement of more individuals. Uh, sourcing of water, especially not only because of climate change, because of weaker infrastructure and lack of investment in in those with a population growth. So basically, it's a quantipling uh, issue that will probably recreate itself uh, all across in, in intensifying forms. So yes, I do agree that is a dimension we should have definitely covered as well. Thank you, Mark. Same, we've seen what's happened to the environment in Turkey and how NGOs or the civil society activists are sidelined on this. But this is this is such a big issue, uh, the climate change. And uh, cu- of course, the lack of climate change coupled with uh, under the lack of it underpinned by corruption, of course. But this is something that feeds into resilience and stability. I mean, I completely agree with what Maha, Mark, and you have already put forward in terms of resilience, right? But I also want to put another item on the agenda, gender-based violence that is taking place in forced migration and in other places. So there are so many other themes that we really need to focus on. and, and, And also the second point, which is always my point about the region, for the region to recognize itself as a unit and start negotiating and cooperating amongst each other, that's all going to be a major start, I think, in terms of any type of resilience definition that we move forward with and thank you for inviting us by <laughs> thanks paul you've got paul the european the european are you a european yes you're a european the barcelona has the last word but please thank you judy um on on resilience 30 seconds i mean i think we we need to escape the understanding of resilience only as a foreign policy strategy resilience depends it's not only about foreign policy, it's also about the internal efforts uh, and reforms that have to be done uh, uh, in the southern neighborhood, in the, in, the, in the same countries with whom we have to interact. But most importantly, to me, resilience has to deal or has to be understood as how can we increase our leverage at yeah. the EU level. And the increasing our EU leverage means putting our instruments together, making trade a foreign policy instrument, making research a foreign policy instrument, making the health policy of the European Union and member states a a foreign policy instrument. Mm -hmm. So resilience needs to escape only its understanding on foreign policy and bring it more to the other various instruments Mm -hmm. that exist on external action. Uh, Paul, thank you. Maha, thank you. Samet, thank you. Mark, thank you. I hate to say this, but we have to escape now, <laughs> to use Paul's word, from this. I want to thank uh, the Carnegie Europe Foundation and all, all our great team back in Brussels and the EU European Union's Horizon 2020 research for, for helping us launch this. And I hope we meet again in much better terms. Keep well and safe. And thank you all very, very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Judy. Bye. Bye. Bye, Judy. Thank Bye. you. Pleasure. Bye. Bye.